Now, September closed out by ushering in a new agreement with our neighbors to the north. Canada will also join Mexico in the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA. Now, this new deal will replace NAFTA, which, of course, is the pact that helps facilitate trade among the three countries, and that's been in effect since 1994. This new agreement won't go into effect until 2020, but aims to open up the Canadian market to U.S. dairy farmers, boost North American car manufacturing, improve labor regulations, and more. Our market analyst is here to help us make sense of the deal. Jeff Peterson is the president of Heartland Farm Partners and has about 20 years of experience in the grain industry. I sat down with him to get his thoughts on the deal and more. Uh, what were your initial thoughts when you heard Canada was going to be a part of the deal that's going to replace NAFTA? You know, I was really relieved. It was, it was nice to have a trade deal be behind us. I think uh, with Mexico and also with Canada, two of our big trading partners, I, I didn't really ever have any doubt that we wouldn't get the deal done, but it's nice to have a completed deal behind us. And uh, some folks are saying that the USMCA is just NAFTA, but with a new name. NAFTA rebranded, if you will. Do you agree with that? What are some of the new new parts of this deal? Well, there's a couple things in there that I think that stand out to us. I mean, on the ag side, probably just one predominant one, that's over on the dairy side. You know, the Class 7 milk issue, that was a big deal. And for Canada to go ahead and step away from that. And actually, the other win I think we have, Troy, is that we actually end up having probably greater penetration into their market than we would have got through the TPP. And I think that's a big win because I think a lot of people were concerned that we stepped away from TPP and we weren't going to get those same type of concessions in, in the USMCA. So I think that was good to see. And let's talk about the farm bill for a second, the deadline on that. It's come and gone. So how concerning is that to you? Well, it's not real concerning to me. I mean, what I think is and how, what we're kind of building into our thoughts on the markets is that we're going to get a one-year extension at some point. I think they'll build into it. Now, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I don't think this will be the case, but it could revert back to the 1949 Agricultural Act. But I don't think we'll see that. But uh, overall, for us, it's not going to have too much impact. Any programs you think that could suffer as a result of the delay on the farm bill? Yeah, there's a little bit that they talk about the land stewardship programs are a little bit in question. Any of the programs that relate to kind of developing trade and building trade and even some of the food aid programs look like they could get hurt. But the two big ones as part of this, the SNAP and the crop insurance, you know, it looks like they'll continue forward without any hiccup. So that's a good thing. So what do you think it is going to take to get the farm bill passed? You know, we're going to have to go ahead and actually have some good old um, negotiating, and we're going to have to have statesmen who can actually come together, because really the big hang-up that we end up having right now gets back to how do we handle the work requirement as it relates to SNAP. So I think it's going to take both sides just coming together and realizing, you know what, we just need to do what's benefit of, of both sides here as opposed to either single party. All right, let's talk for a sec about the USDA quarterly grain report. How would you compare the findings that uh, we're seeing now to the past year? Well, I think what the thing that came from there, it was, it was disappointing because we ended up seeing bigger stocks ultimately come in the corn and bean side ultimately. But I think the thing that was positive, though, is that 153 million less stocks of corn. That's a good thing. Uh, that go ahead and gives us a chance for some better prices down the road. We did see about 136 million more bushels of soybeans, which is a negative. So it kind of gave something, whether you're a bull or a bear in that situation. As we dig a little bit deeper in the numbers, though, that's where it gets a little bit interesting. As you take a look at the Nebraska numbers, for instance, and we like to look at that to give us an idea of what's the amount of bushels that we have to go ahead and deal with at harvest time. 47.8 million less acres are uh, bushels of corn. Uh, that's a good thing for Nebraska. However, we're going to have 17.8 million more bushels of soybeans. But you bring those two together and that means we're almost going to have 30 million less bushels. So that means more space for this harvest to go into. One additional thing that we do like to do though, Troy, is we like to look at how does the pile at harvest time from 2018 compare to 2017. So we take the stocks, we add in the production, and what it looks like this year compared to last year going to be about 150 million more bushels, 6.5%. That'd be a big problem if harvest wasn't kind of grinding along slow. All right, Jeff, let me get your overall reactions on the latest weekly crop progress report. You think weather is going to have any impact on harvest? Yeah, I do. That's a big concern of ours. I mean, harvest is moving along rather slowly. Nationally, we're about 26% harvested. Uh, that compares to about 16% last year and 17% on the five-year average. We're setting about 23% harvested on the soybeans. 
Um, in the past, last year was kind of slow. It was only 14% complete this time of year. The five-year average is 20. We think a couple weeks down the road from here, though, we think we're going to really slow up here. We think we actually could get on the bean side all the way back to where it could be the second slowest over the last 10 years. Only year that would be slower would be 2009. That's mainly because of the heavy rains that are forecasted over the next two weeks. Yeah, and you were talking about soybeans, still kind of touch and go as far as the soybeans go. You think uh, we're going to see less soybean acreage next year because of uh, all the uncertainty in, in, in that market along with the stockpiles that, of, of soybeans that we currently have? Yeah, I think we are, and there's already a lot of talk about that, that there's going to be less bean acres. Now, one thing that we're going to have to think about that might make a little bit of a change on that, the farmer might be delaying that decision a little bit longer than what he normally does. And the reason I bring that up is that he may not get a chance this fall to do as much field work as what he normally does. May not get a chance to put on quite as much fertilizer as what he normally does. But our estimations would be we could see six to seven million less acres on the soybean side than what we had this past year. So definitely uh, going to have to make some adjustments. And what do you think if a farmer still has unsold corn or soybeans at, at this point? What should they do? Yeah, at this point, if there are bushels that are going to have to go into town, our first recommendation is if the storage is, say, less than six cents per bushels per month or less than 18 cents to get us all the way out to January 1st, we'd recommend going under storage or delayed pricing. If he isn't able to go ahead and go the storage or delayed pricing route because those rates are too high, then we'd recommend some type of deferred pricing contract where he can get the price set and then he still gets a chance to get a better price later if the prices go higher. He picks a price or a reference point somewhere out in May or July. Those futures prices go up, he still gets a higher price. The last thing we'd look at would be a basis contract. Now the nice part about either the basis or the extended price contract is that does allow him to get an advance so he has some additional cash to use. If he's got bushels that are on the farm, I would say that are unsold, I would say just go ahead and wait. We look for better prices on the future side, on the cash side, and also a narrowing basis further down the road. Gotcha. And uh, before we wrap up, talk about some of the latest things you have going on with Heartland Farm Partners right now. You know, one of the things we're starting to do more is we're, we're looking at ahead to next year. We think the marketing decisions are going to have to probably be made a little bit sooner this next year than they maybe have been in some other years. And some of this gets to be because of the positiveness of having those additional or less bean acres come in might mean there could be quite a few more corn acres. The other thing we're starting to do is trying to put out some of our more, more of our information on Twitter. And so I try to put out more at Jeff Peterson 01. So that's something as we try to get more information out to everybody. So that's a couple things we're working on right now, Troy. 